You are listening to KC Sports Network, the number one podcast network for today's Kansas City sports fans. With former players from your favorite teams, informed perspectives, and former insiders, this is the place for you. KC Sports Network is proudly presented by Emprise Bank, your partner in Possible. What is up? Welcome into another edition of Mizzou. That's who here on the Kansas City Sports Network. I am one of your wonderful co-hosts, Tucker Franklin, here with Gabe Diarmid and Maggie Johnson. Mizzou coming off a 24-17 to loss against the Florida Gators in the Swamp. 11 a.m. kickoff. We spent, a, spent some time last week talking about how weird things happened against Florida, weird things happened at 11 a.m. in the Swamp. And it didn't quite go Missouri's way. I think that there are a couple of times where you thought Missouri could make a comeback, uh, much like in Missouri's past few games where you thought Missouri was going to do something. And then it just never happened. Um, maybe the team with the worst luck in the country. I don't know. We'll talk about it. But, Gabe, uh, you were at the Swamp, correct? How, how was that atmosphere? At 11? No, um, I was in my living room. Uh, Gerard Hamilton was in the swamp for us. Uh, he said it was Good. cool. He enjoyed the open-air press box. Um, I was... Uh, I enjoyed the atmosphere in, in my house. It was good. That's the best way to do it. I enjoyed it as well. Uh, Maggie, how was your game viewing experience for this weekend? Um, I watched with some Mizzou fans at the Post in Maplewood here in St. Louis. So that was nice. Oh, um, nice. The Tiger Club puts on, a, um, they hop around to the different posts. So uh, it was pretty close to my house this week. So I went to it and it was a roller coaster of emotions, as most of our games typically tend to be. So, what are you gonna? Do? <laughs> what are you gonna do? They, they've I been mean, ending more to... on the on the the valleys lately. Yes, they've been ending more on the valleys. It's just disappointing. It's just disappointing. You go into it and you have like all this hope, and I don't know why. Sometimes mm. the hope. You know, and it's funny because people will send me messages and they'll be like, oh, your time's coming. I'm like, don't give me that hope. Don't do that to me. That's not fair. (laughs) Georgia fan that just told me that. (laughs) That's not fair. So It's like the Nebraska fans who used to clap for you walking off the field after they beat you 73 to 7. Yeah. 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 uh... It's inappropriate. (laughs) So I went on, I went on a Florida podcast and they were talking about and I, they were talking about the Mizzou and everything like that. And they're just like trying to like trash talk me. They're like, oh, yeah, you guys spent everything in the tank against Georgia. I was like, yeah, probably. I don't I mean, I was like, <laughs> I don't know. I don't know if this game is like, do you think this game will be close? I'm like, probably not. <laughs> just like they tried to trash talk me, but I was already so far down in the dumps that it didn't matter. Um, and I've tried. I, I tried the positive route right with the Auburn game. I thought, hey, maybe maybe Mizzou could win this one. Um, and then once I started to go negative during that game, they started to turn it around. So I was like, hey, maybe maybe you know what? They know that I'm going negative. They got to prove me wrong. I'll, I'll keep going negative if I have to, uh, just for the betterment of, of everyone in, in uh, Mizzou Nation. But it has yet to happen, has yet to result in a W in the win column. One of the tweets that I saw, I can't remember who it was from, uh, but somebody tweeted like, do you guys realize that we're like five plays away from being five and one? And I was like, yeah, that's true. But when you start playing that game, it's it's a dangerous game to play. Um, yeah, but this isn't this team is not a five and one team. You know who's who else is five plays from being five and one? Like almost everybody who's two and four. I, I mean, okay, maybe not Oklahoma because they would have had to change twenty seven plays on Saturday, right? But mm-hmm. I, I mean, most get and because fans don't even boil it down a lot of times, like the Auburn game. Okay. One play you change one play. Absolutely. But so often, and look, I was guilty of it in the Georgia game, right? You change the false start on the one yard line that changes it. Well, does it change? Maybe it changes the game, but that was the second quarter. There's a lot of other things that happened. And, you know, I know a lot of people have said, well, on this play, there was pass interference and the whole game's different. If that gets, well, but maybe, but maybe not. Yeah, that third, that Georgia third down, the hands of the face call. I mean, you converted, it, so right. it, it's possible. Mm-hmm. I'm not. It's ha- always hard to say that one play is what changed everything because one play typically doesn't change everything. I mean, if you say that, if you say one call changed the entire game, then you could easily say one dropped pass changed the entire game. I mean, you just can't really pick and choose too much. And I'm a little. I don't want to say I'm guilty of it. But with this, that, um, that, uh, Florida get the, when they converted on the fourth and two, and there was a very blatant hands to the face, 
and they ran 40 yards and scored a touchdown on this drive. I mean, I'm guilty of saying things like that too, because you see it. And as a fan, you're like, well, that's not fair, but that's, that's, that's Missouri. Like yeah. we got the hands of the face called against us the week before we, they don't call it against Florida this week. I mean, what can you really do? You can't do anything. Well, and look, Missouri is losing these games in the first half. Like mm. that's there. They lost Auburn in the first half because they fell behind 14, nothing. They lost Florida in the first half because Florida had 65 yards of offense at halftime and was in a tie game. That should not have been a tie. Florida should have had zero points at halftime. Yeah. They lost Georgia in the first half because they were ahead 16, three, but probably should have been ahead at least 20 to three, you know? So I th- we focus on the one at the very end, but like there are a lot of things they could have done in the first 30 minutes to change those games. Absolutely. And, uh, you, you bring up that Florida game, another good showing for the defense. I've seen a few tweets from a different people. The advanced analytics, the advanced metrics do love the Missouri defense. I believe in, in terms of like EPA per play, they're one of the, the, one of the top teams in the country. There's another metric that I saw. I'll have to look it up here. I saw on Twitter that they're a top 10 defense in terms of this, uh, this metric. So um, there's been some very good showings from the Missouri defense. They kept them in the game for well. That's the Missouri defense is keeping them in games. It's just the offense that just cannot score points. And when the offense is allowing points, uh, like pick sixes and stuff like that, that's not going to help the Missouri defense at all. It's not going to help Missouri at all. Um, so I think that's kind of the frustrating thing. And, and we were kind of talking about before the podcast started. Brady Cook just seems to have one of, some of just the worst luck. And like his the mistakes that Brady Cook makes, the interceptions both against Florida, just came at the worst times. And it's just. It's it's frustrating and like disappointing and just uh, I don't know. It's di- discouraging. It's just one of those things. That, like it just feels like it kicks you while you're down. Like when you're driving and, and Brady Cook puts together maybe his best drive of his collegiate career, and then he throws a pick on third down um, in the red zone. It's just like, man, it it was one of those things where it's like, of course this happened. Like of course this is this was gonna happen on this drive right here. Uh, it's just frustrating the other one he tell about covered it like crazy the, yeah. the other one was telegraphed i mean i think yeah. my grandma my grandma probably could have intercepted right. that ball so <laughs> it was basically well, and, thrown right to the player <laughs> and like some of the blame for that does have to go on the wide receivers mm-hmm. because on that first one it missouri fans wanted to pass interference look that's not pass interference that's the florida defensive back winning at the line of scrimmage. He bumped yeah. Luther Burden off his route, completely legal. So one of two things has to happen there. Either Luther has to avoid getting bumped off the route, he has to win at the line of scrimmage, or he has to do like a way better job of selling it and fall down and flail his arms and maybe get a flag. Um, so, you know, still ideally don't throw the ball, but that's what happened yeah. on that one. Then on the second one, Dominic Lovett got bumped and the Florida cornerback that picked that off said, I watched that play three times on film last night. I knew the route he was going to run. And he just beat Dove to the ball. And, you know, Dove tried to get his arm in there. And I, I know some people have said he's got to fight harder. I mean, I'm not trying to to take any take all blame off of the, the quarterback in this situation because he deserves some. Like, absolutely, he deserves some. But he's not getting a ton of help either. I think it's one fair. Of my, think- one of my issues with Brady is that I feel like you always, he has the play in his mind and like, no matter what, that's where he's going. He's not really a think on his feet, like able to make something out of something that isn't there. And I think that's probably my biggest issue. I I think one of the mistakes we make though, and sometimes it's true. I mean, I was listening to the broadcast in the first quarter and Howard Richard said, look, that was his first read and he never moved off his first read. And that's why that happened. Howard's probably qualified to say that. I feel like me sitting in the press box, I don't feel qualified to say what Brady Cook's first read is or what else he looked at necessarily on any given play. I mean, there are times, right, when if he just raises up and throws the ball straight to somebody, it's pretty obvious. But I, I feel like every quarterback that doesn't play well, that's the critique of him. Well, he just never goes to a second read. I mean, I've heard it about every Missouri quarterback since Chase Daniel, I think. And I just don't know if that's true. I don't know what his first read is. I I. I don't have an angle that can tell me if he looked a different way or turned his head. I, 
I just think it's too easy. Sometimes I'm sure it's true, but I think it's too easy of a criticism that we just don't have the information to make. I, I'm i curious, um, Gabe, when you brought this the point up about the receivers kind of getting bumped off of their routes, to me watching that game, it just looked like Florida had more athletes. Like it, they, Mizzou just kind of looked out athlete in that game. Yeah, Mizzou's got some athletes in, in wide receiver, and I think a defensive line they played really well. But especially the Missouri's offensive line against like the defensive front uh, for Florida, I was just one of those things where it was just like, man, this doesn't look very good for Mizzou. Yeah, my favorite was the 420 pounder from Florida. That Heck of an athlete massive. specimen there. But um, I, I mean, Missouri's got some athletes, but also in that game, Dominic Lovett wasn't himself, right? Yeah. He was not 100%. Luther Burden, I mean, I question if Luther should have been on the field. They're saying in the broadcast, he couldn't even cut in practice. I, I get the kid wants to play, I get you want to play him, but it, we watched Connor Bazelak last year and you just kept thinking, what if he just would have sat two weeks? Would he have been yeah. healthy later in the year? And I hope the same thing happened with Mookie Cooper last year. He had a foot injury and they brought him back too fast and it was all year long. So the concern now is look, I'm wondering, you got the bye week, sit him against Vanderbilt, just sit him and say, we know you want to play, but like their game, we should win this game without you. There are games we need you for, and we need you 100%, not 70%, and then the next week 60 because you got hurt again, and then 80, and then back to 50. Like, we just need to get you to 100%. And, hey, I don't know. Um, I, they didn't have Barrett Bannister. So basically, I don't know, three of their top four receivers or maybe their top three weren't in that game. They need to do kind of what – I always applauded James Franklin for doing this whenever he was a player, because I remember he did an interview. He sat, you know, a few games uh, during that season. And he said, he's like, I'm listening to my body. He's like, I, this is the only way that I'm going to heal. And he willfully sat out of those games. He, you know, it wasn't about cortisone or anything like that. He just knew what his body needed. And that's exact. And we went on to win, you know, the SEC because he was healthy to play most of the games. So it's things like that. I totally agree. If, if he's even at 80% right now, just sit him. Mackay yeah. Mackay Miller did. He played well. Played well. Yeah. Mm -hmm. He was, I think I Mo put him as him and Mookie as like two of my stars yeah. of the game, honestly. Mookie Cooper played well, yeah. yeah. Mookie Cooper, four receptions, 58 yards. Uh Mackay Miller, two receptions for 38 yards. Um, can't really complain about that. Uh, I don't think so. But uh, yeah, that receiving room is banged up it's tough to see because that's that's really the the position group where i think they they have the most talent um on the offensive side of the ball i mean you could probably argue running back they got some talented running backs but i think wide receivers when you got a five-star wide receiver coming in it's hard to say they're not talented uh but i think that's probably the biggest uh the biggest bummer i guess you could say is the 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 health of the the wide receiver room and, and yeah it's just this offense continues to be so incredibly well. I wouldn't say they're inconsistent because they're consistently they're consistent. They're consistently <laughs> not good, um, and that's and the, and if they're consistently like average, I think this team is a, a whole lot different with how well the defense has been playing. Um, keeps them in. They're been keeping them into games if they can put some points up on the board. It, listen, when you're in the spot where your defense has to score for you to like be in a in a good spot in a game that's not a good spot to be in uh there's there's times where i'm watching missouri's defense saying like okay you're gonna have to get like a pick six or a scoop and score here for me to feel even comfortable with trying to come back in this game like the defense has to do something or a special teams blunder has to happen uh for the other team for me to feel comfortable you're, you're talking about like that when you're talking about mizzou trying to be in games and that's not fun well because look what's happened the last two weeks i mean they just wore down against Georgia. They just ran out mm -hmm. of gas and, and Georgia ran in second half, Florida ran for 212 yards. And like, look, that's not good, but you can't ask them to be perfect. Right. I mean, they play, they basically gave up 14 points. You should win every single game where you give up 14 points, but special teams gave up three offense gave up seven. And that's where you're at. Can't be doing that. Can't be giving up points on offense if you're not going to score any points on offense. I, I mean, Cook against Power Five teams this year has one touchdown and five picks. 
And that doesn't even include <sighs> the two picks Jack Abraham threw. So it's one and seven for Missouri quarterbacks in against power five teams. And I don't care what, I, I mean, this is what we talked about at the beginning of the year. What's the worst case scenario? You get to the bye week and you're two and four and your best win is Louisiana Tech. That's where we yeah. are. That, that was the worst case scenario. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so no, I, really the only the only games out of those that we kind of talked about, we we counted this game as a loss. We counted Georgia as a loss. And I think we had Auburn a toss up. I think you you guys maybe had K-State as a win and or a loss, and I had the other, whatever it was opposite. But why does it feel so much worse now? Here, I mean, we didn't get that K State or Auburn win, but it feels worse. It, here's why: because even the people that were looking at eh, this is a rebuilding year, all that you expected, they've had three swing games. You thought they'd win one, right? I mean, the the path to six and six always included K State, Auburn, or Florida. You always had to win one of those. Auburn is, I think, worse than people expected. I mean, Auburn's the 12th best team in the SEC, and they're only 12th because they beat Missouri. Um, Florida, I don't know, 10th? Like, that's the problem. These are not – the Georgia game doesn't even figure into this to me. Well done, good effort. I'll even give you a moral victory for that. But you don't get moral victories against a Florida team that's going to be playing in, like, the Mayo Bowl. I, I mean, it's not – you know, you – those are the teams that if you want to – get to wherever they want to get to, not just this year, but as a program, like you've got to win some of these games. I, I, I mean, and they're there to be one and Missouri's not doing it. So I've, I've honestly been really surprised at the number of Missouri fans that it still are, are, Hey, well, we're close. No, you know what? I grew up watching Missouri in the 1980s when they finished one and 11 close was okay. Then that's not, that's not the goal here. And to their credit, right. Eli Drinkwitz isn't saying that. I mean, the players are saying, hey, we're close, but they're not like taking solace in it. I, I've i been surprised at the number of fans that are just going, well, yeah, it's, I mean, we're probably going to be four and eight this year, but next year's the big year. I mean, we just keep moving it down the road and, mm -hmm. and I don't quite get it. Yeah. I, I wonder if it's the recruiting aspect of it, if it's the fact Part that Eli has recruited so well. I know there's a, there was a tweet going around too about Eli and, and Barry Odom's first records and uh, the first, what is it, 19 games um, of their career. And they are close, but Barry Odom has the edge by a game. And he has, does he have another bowl game appearance or, a, or at least? Um, well, Eli would have made two bowl games, but. He That's wasn't true. To in the first yes. year, so and and you do have to understand Eli's first year was ten SEC games and no Northern Iowa's or whatever. Um, so I, I don't think that the record comparison is necessarily a big deal. But I, my whole thing is just we started this year and I said I need to see a winning record to give me proof that this is going the right direction. And I'm not saying it's going the wrong direction, and I 100% would not fire him after this year. But if somebody can point to me, like, give me the reasons why you feel good, why why you why you think this is going the right, well, why this year is a step forward. I mm. I I don't know what they are at this point. Also, another thing, kind of with that that um, Barry Odom versus Drinkwitz comment, and I don't. Uh, um, this is just coming from me, so I don't know if this is completely facts or not. But Gary Pinkle was a better recruiter than Barry Odom. I mean, that's a, we would could all probably agree with that, wouldn't you say? Mm -hmm. the, but Odom got Pinkle's recruits, and Drink got Odom's recruits, and I this to is me also, that's two different sides of the spectrum. I mean, that's true. Okay. This is also like our fault. And by our fault, I mean me and rivals. And because once you get on campus, what you were ranked as a high school player really doesn't matter. Right. Right. I, I mean, um, a five star that becomes a three star, it's not a five star. It doesn't matter. You know, I don't care what you were two and a half years ago when it's what we talked about going into the K-State game. Everybody said Missouri has more talent. Well, why? Because Rivals said they did three years ago. But I watched that game. K-State has more talent. And people still say Gary Pinkle was he was like an average recruiter. 
No, he was pretty good because he won a lot of games. It's yeah. just Rivals was wrong on a lot of the kids that he was right about, you know? So I, I, I've always, I think I talked about this with, uh, I think it was during basketball season. Uh, people said that Conzo, I don't know, somebody was a good recruiter, but a bad coach. No, good recruiters are good coaches because they recruit good players and they and good yeah. players win games, you know? Um, now, again, we could do 12 shows. Star rankings matter. Hi, having highly ranked classes matter. But there are always exceptions. I watched Scott Frost fail with good recruiting. I watched Butch Jones fail with good recruiting. I watched Mike Leach and Gary Pinkle win with what rivals in 247 and on three said was bad recruiting. So it it's a guideline, but there are exceptions. I mean, Coach Calipari had a team that won eight games a couple of years ago. I guarantee that those recruiting classes weren't low. Recruiting <laughs> classes by any means. So, 100%. yeah, I think... That stuff can happen in the in those years for sure. Yeah. Uh, one of the coaches that comes to mind is Mike Gundy. Mike Gundy never has highly right. touted uh, classes, but Oklahoma State the past like fifteen years has always been in it. They've always been in the mix, um, and I just think that's because he's a really good football coach. So, um, yeah, I know that that twenty twenty class was not good, um, and I no. think Drink took over in December and had to kind of do a whole lot of damage control in that 2020 class. And it, it it's a tough way to start your tenure, especially in the middle of a pandemic. Right. Um, so he, he didn't have the easiest start. So maybe that is giving him a little bit of grace here. Uh, but his classes since then have been really good. Still working away on this 2023 class has, has landed some pretty good prospects already. Um, but yeah, I think that, we did talk about the winning. The winning needs to happen. And and Drink even said so. He said he's got to tone it down. Didn't he say his dad said that he's got to tone it down a little bit until he starts to win some games? And, I mean, listen, Missouri fans are getting what Drink was uh, – like the checks that Drink's mouth wrote, Missouri fans are getting it dealt right back to him. And it's just like one of those things where, like, you can't really say anything right now because, like, yeah, you just have to take your lumps because – they're right. The other the other fans seem they're, they're right. Like Kansas State fans have every right to, you know, kind of dig in at Mizzou there um, after, you know, what Drinkwitz did and what they took exception to. Uh, Auburn fans, Florida fans, whatever, whoever, they can do it, um, especially Florida fans after Drink mocks their coach getting fired. And now their coach is on the halftime show. I don't do that. Do you guys think that was weird? Um, I don't know. Well, I, I didn't watch the halftime show. I didn't. But yeah, Mullen yeah. seems like a weird fit for doing media because yeah. i just like i had no idea he was so unlikable until the last few years and like everybody that covers the sec is like oh no he's miserable yeah it was weird um <laughs> but anyway i got off on a chase to squirrel right there um <laughs> no i think uh, that's the thing with with drink what's too is people are so and we talk about this probably every single week on this show is that college football is just so reactionary mm -hmm. after every week it's like George is going to win the national championship. And then it's Alabama is going to win the national championship or it's, it's, it just changes every single week. Now it's Ohio state looks really good. Um, it's just so reactionary. And I think that people who always wanted to fire drink are, are just being too reactionary in this. It's a bit, it's a long game. It's a big picture thing, but like, yeah, you do have to be more than 500. Um, if for you first, would this be, would this be the final third year or through four? Third, third through three. Okay. So yeah, I, I mean, but it. there's so much gray area here, right? It, it doesn't have to be give the guy a Mel Tucker contract or fire. Him. It, yeah. it, and it, it, I fight this every day on our board. I say, look guys, here's what I'm worried about. Well, why do you hate him? Why do you want to fire? Him? No, I don't. I 100% don't think he should be fired, but it's okay to look at this team and go, I I got some serious concerns whether this thing's going the right direction. And I think we'll we'll realize a lot in the offseason too, especially if he doesn't put a lot of focus on the trenches, because if he doesn't bring in a no line, we're not gonna win next year either. I mean, <laughs> you're you're just kind of gonna put whoever's at quarterback, probably Sam Horn, in the line of fire. Sam. But at some point, too, like, and next year has to be this point. I understand why these 2021 and 2022 kids aren't necessarily a ton of them on the field, but next year they have to be, right? I mean, yeah. uh, Armand Mimbo needs to be starting. Uh, 
you know, Makai Miller is going to be more heavily in the rotation. All these guys that made up these classes, and that's why next year kind of is judgment year, not in the terms of you don't have to win 11 games. But next year, those guys are going to be on the field. I mean, I went through it. I think I think there are 21 players who signed with Barry Odom who are still on this team. So about three quarters of the roster is his. And now not all those guys are contributing, but most of them are because honestly, if they were signed under Odom and aren't contributing, they've been, uh, it's been suggested they might find other places to play football by now. Right. Um, but you know, you're talking about guys like JC Carlisle and Harrison Nevis. And, you know, these are uh, for better or for worse, Brady cook. I, I mean, these are our guys that are contributing, but next year, there's not going to be very many of them. It's going to be 90, 95% Eli's roster. And these guys in these classes are going to be out there and they're going to be the backbone of the program. Yeah. And so then, then that kind of makes me think, so wait, do you want to give him actually another year after that? And is that a dangerous game for me to play? So like, if that's the first year with uh, basically his whole team, should you then give him two years with his whole team? Um, who knows if the athletic department thinks that same way? I wouldn't I, right. listen. I wouldn't be upset if the athletic department was like, you know what? Let's just ride the ship here. Let's just see. Let's just see how this thing works out. Uh, do you know his contract off the top of your head, Gabe? I don't know if that's something that you. Keep he's up got with. right now. He's got three years after this. Um, if he wins eight games, which is basically mathematically impossible at this point, not completely, but it's not going to happen. Um, <laughs> Eight games or wins a bowl game, he gets one year added to it. So, you know, Just if they could year? find a way to six and six and win the Birmingham Bowl or whatever, he gets a, a fourth year. Um, they owe him at the end of every year, they owe him 70% of what's left on the contract if they fire him. So, like, if they fired him after this year, he, they would owe him $8.4 million. I don't really know That's that this is an athletic good. department in position to do. And again, like, I feel like I have to say this every 12 seconds so that I don't open Twitter. I don't think they should fire him, and I don't think they're going to fire him, and I will call them stupid if they fire him. I'm literally advocating for them to f- to play out the rest of his contract. That's what that's the <laughs> point I was going. I think that they should play out the rest of the contract regardless. Number one, I guess you I guess say you don't lose money, but, like, I, you would probably in some way. I'm not a businessman. Um but I just think that sometimes the trigger, sometimes the leash is too short. And I don't want to be a victim of like the leash right. being too short. He goes somewhere else and does really well. Right. Um, and then, then you have Missouri fans looking, well, wait, maybe it was us in the breakup. Maybe we were the problem. Um, I, I think it's this simple. I think this program and his success here rides on Sam Horn being as good as people want Sam Horn to be. Yeah. If he is, this can work. If he's not, I don't know that Eli's here in two years. I'll take the Birmingham bowl, by the way. If we want to win six games. <laughs> a five I'll and seven take... qualifier. Uh, oh, no. bowl. That should no. not be a thing. They should no, not we'd it. have to win six, but I will take I will take it. I will take it. <laughs> Listen, I will go. Five and seven Missouri like against... if, if anyone's listening, I will I will go to the Birmingham Bowl if our team can get us in it. Okay. <laughs> I, Let's do that I will not. Show. <laughs> I will not. Me and Maggie live with Gabe uh, remote in, in his Columbia. living room. Yeah. <laughs> Watching <laughs> the Birmingham full is what it will be. Wait, wait, uh, would I actually have to watch it? Oh, no, you just have to be there for the show. That's it. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Good deal. <laughs> Those are the stipulations. Uh, well, we mentioned it earlier at the top. By week next week, nothing to preview, nothing for me to um, look at and be disgusted about how Missouri is going to do next week. No lines to look at. Um, so how do you guys plan on spending your bye week? That's my question to you. I actually have, I'm actually doing something really cool. Um, my good friend, she listens to the podcast every week. So I'm going to shout her out. Cause she always tags me on her Instagram. Um, my good friend, Bonnie, her brother plays for um, Stanford. So we are going to Notre Dame to watch Stanford play at Notre Dame this weekend. Oh, nice. Yeah. So I've never been uh, to South Bend. I've never. It's very cool. Yeah, I'm really excited. I grew up in a football family, so obviously I'm very excited to go there. So that's my bio weekend plans. Good deal. Yeah, we'll be in Chicago at uh, my son's school has very kindly for the second consecutive year scheduled parents weekend on Mizzou's Vice. So I appreciate that they 
do that. Now, I don't know if they look specifically at the Mizzou schedule or ask when you know they should do it, but it's worked out two years in a row. So. It's all for you. Sweet. Yeah. They're like this way. Oh, it nice <laughs> um, it's thoughtful oh, of them. That's right. I, I almost said, I'm not sure what I'm doing. KCSN's having their golf tournament this weekend. It was strategically planned on the bye week of both K State and uh, the Missouri, so we could have our golf tournament now. KU plays Oklahoma, which that might Suddenly. be a game. <laughs> might right. be a game. Um, we we were talking about that actually a little bit. We're like, well, um, we should probably do a KU show because they're playing kind of well. And I'm like, eh, whatever. I don't really want to do that. <laughs> and and BJ's like, well, what's the what's the most interesting game? And I was like, probably Oklahoma. And he's like, oh, just the the weekend that we scheduled our golf tournament because we didn't think that that was going to be a game. Is now maybe the most highly anticipated KU game since 2009. Um, I don't know about that. It's probably the TCU game. Until the Texas week, game. Yeah. Until the Texas game, because I feel like KU, uh, Texas at KU will be, uh, you know, Texas coming in trying to get their redemption a little bit from last year. Although that loss looks a little less bad now that they've done what they've done this year. So, eh. Still pretty awful. <laughs> <laughs> Both of you, your favorites. Uh, yeah, no, I might go to that K, the KU Texas game, just decked out in burn orange, and just see what happens. I don't even like particularly love Texas. I t- nobody, nobody does. I, I mean, but I would cheer for them. Obviously, I'd throw the horns <laughs> up. <laughs> I'd, 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 I'd go. <laughs> People would be like, "How long have you been a Texas?" I'd buy a cowboy hat for it. Uh, that's how. That's Six. how committed I'd be to the bit. Um, so yeah, no. Um, Good week to to. Did you watch the the KU TCU game? Did you guys watch that game? I didn't because it was on the same time as Missouri and Florida, and oh, you know, it, Missouri and Florida was close enough throughout that like there wasn't really any chance to say, "Hey, I want to see Texas score again," or "I want to see what's going on with with the other games." I watched the TCU um, Kansas game. Uh, just because it was up on a screen, you know, mm-hmm. I just had to keep like turning around and look at it. Uh, same with the Arkansas game. Um, watching them lose wasn't the worst part of the weekend either. There was a bunch of good losers. I mean, we were one of them, but yep. you know, there <laughs> was a bunch of people I didn't mind losing this week. I mean, low key, the SEC Missouri schedule is not. I mean, there are winnable games on this schedule. There's only I'm one sure. game that you look at and go, yeah, they're not winning that. I mean, they're not winning in Knoxville. You know, no, no. they're but good. Outside good. of that, I mean, you look at every game, which again is why you got to get some of them. <laughs> you got to close on some of these because South Carolina's not great, Kentucky's not great, you know, Vandy's not good, and New Mexico State is the worst team in FBS football. Yeah, because Colorado State lost. Um, or they won, I mean. No, I'm looking at the schedule now. I do this every week, Gabe. You've got to stop me from doing this thinking <laughs> they could. Thinking they you could know what's going to happen. Positivity. Right. <laughs> they, could, they could do it. Vanderbilt. I mean, they could. It in. It's like, it, it's it, it hey, look, it, like, seriously, that Vanderbilt game. I mean, it they don't win that close. game. It's off the rails if they don't win that game. I mean, that's the moment where it, it could – Okay, we could start seeing the finger pointing, and and it could fall apart if they lose to Vandy. They did hang twenty eight on uh, Old Miss last week, but they did. But uh, Old Miss scored fifty two, so uh, that <laughs> that kind of makes it a little tough to win football games. They've got Georgia this week, um, so I'm curious to see if they also get drummed fifty five to three like they did against Alabama, or uh, what Georgia team shows up there. But Georgia seemed to take care of Auburn just fine um last weekend but looking at the schedule for mizzou vanderbilt i'll pencil that in as a w i was at a point where i thought vanderbilt was going to be a loss i'll be honest um south carolina who who knows who knows you can pencil they they played decent last weekend yeah i would expect south carolina will be favored in that game they should be they they probably should be um Kentucky probably will be favored. It depends on Will, if uh, Will Levis is back or not. I think that depends right. on a lot of these games, too, because uh, mm-hmm. there's just some quarterback health issues. Uh, Tennessee, that's not going to happen. New Mexico State could be a W. Is KJ Jefferson back by <laughs> Black be, Friday? Could be a W. <laughs> I'm, not getting too, I'm not getting too far on my skis. I mean, it, Arkansas could be five and six. That could be like a 
Hey, who's that could be a Birmingham Bowl play in <laughs> and also a uh yo Barry Odom, that defense is real bad, man. You might you might be kind of fighting for something at that point. Yeah. Um so I mean it's it's mathematically possible. Oh, sure. I've done it again. I've done it again, Gabe. Here we go. This um, this whole show is really just Tucker's therapy session going from, oh my God, life sucks to, all right, me and Maggie are going to Birmingham for New Year's. Yeah. <laughs> going, <laughs> going to the Birmingham Bowl. Um, Idaho Potato Bowl, because is that one a possibility? What's, what's I don't the, think that's a tie-in. I think the Birmingham Bowl was like the lowest SEC bowl game. Well, we're, I thought we were in like the lowest one. Who got a bowl game lower than us last year? Oh, no. Missouri got the Armed Forces Bowl because the Armed Forces Bowl isn't even an SEC bowl game. Oh, there were 13 right. <laughs> SEC teams qualified for 12 games. That's right. That's oh. right. That's right. Yeah. What did they have? What did they have? The one with Iowa? That got, it was the Music City Bowl, right? Music City. Yeah. That was the one that got uh, canceled. Was that, was I, that I, Missouri's I, fault or Iowa's fault? At the beginning of this season, I predicted the Las Vegas Bowl. I like they have to get really hot for that to happen. And I'm just, I had hopes, but I don't think it's going to work out. I don't think it would matter anyways. We'd still get the low. We'd get the lowest bowl. I mean, it's kind of like how we beat South Carolina last year. There's no reason South Carolina should have been in the Mayo Bowl over us, but here we are. I know that's well, such a Mizzou fan thing to say, but that's how it always tends to happen. Is that it doesn't matter? They just put the team in that they want there anyway. I mean, South Carolina is like an hour and a half from the Mayo Bowl, but I, I, I do like kind of enjoy how because I remember in 2013 and 14, like it was just this chorus of, oh, it's so great to be in a league that likes where everybody gets along and they like us and we're treated equal. Now it's just SEC hates us. Why does everything suck? It didn't take very long. <laughs> the uh, I, so I just looked it up while you guys were talking about the 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 bowl tiers. Uh, the lowest one is actually the Union Home Mortgage Gasparilla Bowl. Um, oh, yeah. And then it's also the Birmingham but Bowl. That's The oh, Gasparilla yes. Bowl is in like Tampa, maybe, I think. Yeah, it is. It's at Raymond James, I'm pretty yeah. sure. I would definitely yeah. take Tampa over Birmingham. That would be much better for our New Year, <laughs> for yeah. our holiday trip. I would consider going to the Gasparilla Bowl. I would not consider there. going to the Birmingham Bowl. <laughs> oh, hey, listen to this. Transperfect Music City Bowl versus the Big Ten. That's a Tier 1 Bowl, baby. Yeah. Who would have thought? Um, I think I, I think you need to look in lower tiers for where yeah. Missouri could play. I I think I think it's at least tier one point five at this point. <laughs> I'm so I'm I'm eyeballing the uh, ticket smarter Birmingham Bowl or the Union Home Mortgage Gasparilla Bowl. That's, that's what I'm eyeing here. We started off with this podcast by me saying that this is the worst football team ever in college football history, and then ending with me eyeing two bowl games that <laughs> quite possibly could be the two worst bowl games of all time. You're, I was going to say, I'm not sure playing in the Gasparilla Bowl disproves your original point. But. Oh, the worst. Getting to, but getting to a bowl game team. is getting to a bowl game is way better than sitting at five and seven. Oh yeah. I mean. Well, let's just I mean, call that's, it how it is. It's way better. Like, it's got to be the goal at this point, right? I'll settle with the 5-7 mm-hmm. and seven bowl qualifier. I'll do it right now. Because I feel like... <laughs> that's a way. I, I feel like if you go into Stop a bowl talking. game... <laughs> I feel like if you go into a bowl game, and then you go into the off season and you're trying to get players to come, and this is almost where you're like, you're, we're almost there statement kind of comes in. You're like... Well, we're almost there if you come play offensive line for us. Mm-hmm. Like, but I don't know it, if you can say we're almost there at five and seven. <laughs> it, it also wouldn't hurt there. if you. It, it also wouldn't hurt if you do get into a bowl game to go ahead and have your best player play and maybe I don't know win that bowl game this year. Yeah, maybe not encourage your best player. <laughs> Sit out. So, uh, um, so Ty- Tyron Hopper, if you could suit up for the Gasparilla Bowl, everyone would greatly appreciate it. Do we know also, does Nate Pete have another year because of COVID? He could. Okay. Like, that's the thing about this team. So many, I I ran through it this morning, 10 of their 12 best defensive players. Well, I mean, like, Rake Straw's coming back, I'm sure. And uh, there's one other guy in there that I'm sure he'll be back. But, uh, but like, 10 of the top 12 guys, they all could come back. But who knows what Hopper's going to do? Who knows what Carlisle, McGuire, Jeffcoat, Jernigan, Charleston, all these guys. Yeah. I mean, 
I don't know. Maybe some of them are just tired of being in college. Darius Robinson's going to be like 27 with four kids pretty soon. So. <laughs> I, I really didn't mean that to sound bad. I have no idea if he has any children at all. He's just been in college a long time. That was my only. Him and Barrett. Him and Bear Bannister. But Bear Bannister, yeah. this they're, is They're like master, Jack Abraham's <laughs> nephews. <laughs> Jack Abraham is older than me. I like to I like to point that out every single time uh, that conversation comes up. He, we graduated high school the same year. year. Yeah. <laughs> Good. Good thing. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, Jack. Um, all right, we should probably end this podcast before I start making up more predictions for the 2023 Missouri Tigers and what bowls they're going to go to. So uh, appreciate you guys listening to this podcast all the way through the end. We'll be back next week with another episode. Even though the Missouri Tigers are on a bye, we'll be back with another episode, maybe with a special guest. You'll have to stay tuned. You'll have to subscribe to the podcast. You'll have to like the video on YouTube and subscribe to our KCSNU YouTube channel to find out. So until next week, we will see you later. <laughs>